had some technical difficulties, but now we're up and running and we're, we're back, back again guys. and we're celebrating the birthday party, uh, 70 years Porsche. Birthday party, and yeah. it's uh, the sports car together day. So uh, let's uh, watch a lovely concert together now. Um, Tanya? Well, we're actually back with our highlight, which is the Jamiroquai concert live in Poland. And for I every think cool party, what do you need, Tanya? You need a cool <laughs> band for a cool birthday party. <laughs> but I think uh, it's one of your favorite bands, right, Phil? Uh, it is. I, I, I think, um, I mean, I followed them um, all my life, um, virtually. I mean, I'm a bit older than that, but uh, they were founded in 1992 as, a, as an acid uh, jazz London funk band. And um, JK, he's a huge a uh, car fan, he's a huge sports car fan, and um, I also love um, his, his albums and his music. Yeah? yeah, a lot of his music videos feature JK driving at high speed in sports cars. What's your favorite album? Well, actually, it's uh, Traveling Without Moving, uh, because there are some songs on there that I really, really love, and I mean, funk music is just great. Well, that album has some of the best songs in it. I mean, the best known songs like Cosmic Girl. And in that music video, you can see JK driving at high speed again in the sports cars. Virtual and Insanity. That's oh. another one for I'm so looking forward to this concert. Without moving. It's all based on <laughs> JK's love for sports cars. So I think it's also the most successful album ever. But now I'm really excited to have a look at the concert, share this moment with you.
birthday Portia. Thank you. Everybody had a good time? Better driving? Get it together in the wet? Don't overcook it? Don't run out of talent? <laughs> okay, this is a track from uh, many years ago when I was a young man and I didn't need a walking stick. This track's called Space Cowboy. Everything.
That's supposed to be a surprise. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs>
Thank you. Okay. Well, there couldn't be a more appropriate track than the next one after flying through the storms today. That was fun. Put in, putting the T in turbulence. Okay. This track's called Cloud Nine. JK is such a Porsche fan and it's great to see him in front of the other Porsche fans at the Silesia racetrack in Poland. Absolutely. It was also great to see all your comments uh, on, on Facebook. It's uh, fantastic to see you're so enthusiastic about uh, the concert and about our live stream. Uh, and we've got another special uh, concerning Jamiroquai, right? Yes, we actually have now an interview with JK and he's great for all you Porsche lovers and nerds. He goes into so much detail about the models that he has. And actually, we've got his original well, model, Porsche model, we have here in the studio. It's a... It's the 911T. It's not his, but no, uh, no, it is sorry, a yeah. 911T. And um, I can tell you um, that uh, JK is a little less sweaty because the interview <laughs> Gabby did was before the concert. Yeah, yeah. We're celebrating <laughs> Porsche's 70th birthday. I'm here with JK. How you doing? 
I'm good. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, so we're celebrating, as I said, the 70th birthday of Porsche, so we're going to have a little talk about cars. And let me start by saying that uh, I remember that in one of the interviews that I did with Sting, he said that he had this memory, childhood memory, of the Queen passing by in his hometown in a luxurious car. And as a child, he thought to himself that... Um, he, doesn't want to, he didn't want to meet the Queen, but he wanted to own a car like that in the future. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, what were your memories when your mother drove you around in those cars? Well, it was, uh, you know, a golden era for cars, 1970s. So uh, you saw Aston Martins and Lamborghinis and Jensens and that kind of stuff, you know. There's a lot of that kind of big muscle stuff on the, on the road. So I knew every single car from the shape of its headlights. Everything was a more distinctive design then and um, so that's where it started really and uh, and also you know television and television programs were all very much based around a motor car there would always be you know there's Starsky and Hutch or you know or the professionals uh, the persuaders yeah. with the Ferrari Dino and uh, the Aston so uh, that's where it came from you know I was always, I was always car crazy. I used to draw cars, try and design cars. So have you ever thought of working in that kind of business instead of singing, you know? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, now I've got my daughters, it's something that I'd probably like them to do, but I mean, to try and, you know... Are to you really trying to persuade them to work in the car business? Uh, well, you know, I mean, just car design. I mean, uh, I spoke one day, I had a, a, a long conversation with the guy who designed the TT, and we talked about, you know, I'd thought about this egg car, you know, that yeah. kind of where the axle and the axle would change, you know, so it would become this tiny thing and then the sort of change its center of gravity, its shape to become a different thing. We talked about that, but I mean, now you see that type of thing happening, you know. That is right. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's something, but then you realize and how many people actually get into the design schools, you know, for this type of uh, thing. And, and so, you know, then it goes back to pure design and it goes back to I, I mean I, I owned a 1950 Porsche you know so one of the very first uh, cars that was bought by an American serviceman in Germany after the war and was uh, that your first Porsche? No it wasn't my first Porsche was a T many years ago many 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 years ago um, and then I didn't have a Porsche for a long time <clears throat> and, in the, and then I suddenly sort of swerved across <laughs> and um, <clears throat> you know I think it was just the, the 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 design of the car and how long it had lasted um, so the first Porsche I had after that was uh, an RS Touring a 73 RS Touring in Dalmatian blue which I've still got oh, wow. and then I had an RS lightweight then I had a 68 2 liter S and then a 55 Speedster and um, uh, then I had a 9146 GT, the uh, Bjorn Voldegard car. Uh, and then it goes on now, you know, some more modern stuff. Um, <clears throat> I've got the new R, the GTRS2, the 918, Carrera GT. Do you remember them all? How many of them have you got? Oh, it's about 15 or 16 now, yeah. It's so. a decent amount. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's, it's a decent amount. I'd say that's, uh, that's bordering on a, a, a addiction. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's like you can drive a, a, for two weeks, you can drive a different car every day. Yeah, well, the, the good thing about Porsche <laughs> is that you can, because you can get in it, and then you will start it, and it will start and do what it's supposed to do. So, yeah. I, I bet that those kind of cars make good memories, make great memories. So do you remember specific situations that, you know, you have deep in your heart, and they're connected with Porsche car? Yeah, I mean, I've had a couple of journeys into Europe, into Switzerland uh, with the touring car, which is really nice, you know, to drive up in the mountains. And, um, and it's one of those box ticking things, you know, so drive it through Germany. Um, and um, yeah, and then kind of use it in its natural sort of environment, you know. Oh, so. What about some like tour memories or something, you know, crazy, hectic? Two memories for me. Oh. <laughs> Where do you start? Oh, I got time. Come on. <laughs> Where do you start? We got you all know. the time in the world. I don't really know. I mean, a lot of touring is uh, is not. Um, I mean, these. You days, don't drive your car then. <laughs> no, I, I have followed the tour before. I followed the tour in a Ferrari once before, and that just became really tiring. 
Uh, what kind? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know. This is 70th birthday of yeah, Porsche, exactly, yeah? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm, I, I, I don't so know, that's, um, <laughs> that's one time I followed the, the, the tour like that, but that became difficult, and I think, I think, I think there was a misconception with touring that yeah. it's this uh, really fun thing. It's actually just getting on the tour bus, doing the arena, and then going on the tour bus for 14 hours, yeah. getting off and doing it again. So, you know. It's uh, not as much fun as you think it is. Yeah, I know. That's what they all say, all artists. Yeah, everybody thinks it's like the, you party like a rock star. You see all the cities in the world. Yeah, and the part, yeah, yeah. You don't even know in which city you are. Yeah, sometimes. well, <laughs> it's, it's a bit like that. You yeah. know, I think the party, I think there's a lot of journeys to and from the show. And I think when you did it, I think in your 20s, it was really great. And then now you get to your approaching 50. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it sort of loses. So it's like you've in 20 it, years for you. So. You've done it before, you know, you've done it before. <laughs> Okay, so there are some modern cars, there are some classic cars, so what are the differences for you? Which one do you prefer? Which ones? Well, I think the 918 is a remarkable car, um, you know, uh, and, and again, you know, having, having uh, effectively, having the three, the big three, as it were, at home, um, it's nice to be able to judge them against each other, but I think the 918, yeah, I mean, it does, it does things in its own way um, that are very special. Um, I think the Carrera GT is a special car um, as well, you know, I think, it's, uh, I think it's something that's just, you know, going to be one of the uh, all-time classics, really, you know. Yeah. I've got an RS4 litre at home as well, you know, the last of the Metzger engine cars, which um, it's, I think is just uh, a special car as well. So, I mean, every car that I have at the moment, I've just ordered a, uh, uh, I've just ordered an oak green metallic, a Targa. Yeah. So I've got a Targa GTS, an oak green metallic, so, uh, which is one of the sort of older Porsche uh, colours. And... Um, so I've ordered that with a manual box, you know, so it's a kind of keeper for me, a special thing. And I've bought a beautiful turbo, a four-speed turbo 1980 car in a Venetian blue metallic with a Pasha interior, 16,000 miles from new. Wow. And I am really into it. And the interior I is just... I can hear, see that. <laughs> the interior is unmarked. Um, and it's... Uh, it's an amazing little thing, you know, and it's just, and you, you know, you get in it now and you forget the impact that car had in, well, I mean, you know, I mean, it was 75, but in 1980 when it came out, you know, in that early sort of period, uh, you forget the uh, impact that that car had and how rapid it is, you know. And I prefer this four speed to the G50 box car, to be honest with you. I think it's a little bit. Fair enough, I guess. A bit rawer. Fair enough, I guess. So, it's the 70th birthday. What, you, what would you wish um, to the brand for the next 70 years? Uh, I wish to be on the list for the Speedster. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, okay. I've got the other I'll tell two. them. <laughs> I'll pass it on. That's what I wish. Uh, I wish to be on the, the not, list for the, like for, for, for the new... For for the the I've, just, I've, just, I've just seen the concept. I did hear a birdie told me it was coming, but um, oh. I've just seen the concept. No, but uh, I... Um, uh, because I've got the uh, I've got obviously the 55 car and the 997 as well, so um, you know it'd be nice to uh, round it off. Um, but um, I uh, well you know I think the company's uh, moving leaps and bounds really with the emission and you know I think it's 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 making its own progress and uh, and forging ahead and I think trying to keep the trying to keep the 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 brand and the company sort of uh, keep its heritage mm -hmm. uh, and keep its sports performance aspect, you know, without it just becoming, uh, you know, within the electric thing, without yeah. it becoming quite, without it becoming dull. I mean, I think some of the electric cars, and some of the, to remain nameless, I think some of what they've done, it's great, but it's pretty dull. And it's important to keep the, you know, the, the concepts exciting and interesting and yes. keep, which is what it's difficult for manufacturers to do, or they don't seem to often do, is to show us the concept of Frankfurt, Ge Geneva, and keep it like the concept. Um, that would be really great. Okay, those were pretty long wishes. Um, we also have a pretty big show coming up tonight, so what have you prepared for all of the Porsche's friend, friends tonight? 
Well, um, we're just talking about whether we should do one song called White Knuckle Ride, which sort of features my 2.7 RS I, I, touring. I think you should. Which I think would be kind of nice, you know. For yeah, all I those think things. so. So, uh, yeah. Birdie's told me. <laughs> that yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, we'll see. Yeah, knowing my crew, they might not be able to find it. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, but the rest of it is just hopefully it won't rain. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> J.K. of Jamiroquai, Celestia Ring, we're celebrating 70th birthday of Porsche. Thank you so much. Happy birthday, Porsche. Wow, that was a fascinating insight into JK's Porsche collection. And for all you Porsche nerds who like to have those fine details, then I hope you've enjoyed that. It was very interesting, um, and he wasn't even wearing a hat. Uh, that was uh, the most interesting part of it. Just the sunglasses. Um, but uh, Tanya, I think we uh, should look at what uh, yeah, our community sure. is uh, What's telling happening us. With sports car hashtag sports car together. Exactly. So we're having a look. We're watching the live stream now. Uh, lovely comments. Thank you very much. But also hashtag sports car together. Um, if you post anything on Instagram or Facebook, then we will see it. And there we have some lovely posts here from Houston, Ryan MC 911. Thank you very much for that one. And here again, Ryan MC. And then, of course, we've got a lot of cars um, that, uh, for example, here from Stuttgart in Germany, um, he just calls his car a beauty, whether it's his car or someone else's. So that's. Insta, um, and let's have a look at Porsche, hashtag sports car together. So here we go. It's all on there. It's currently, there it, there it comes. So here we got some interesting comments. Yuhu, which is German, uh, everyone's here. So there is a lot of interest, and um, it's great that you're here tuned in to our live stream. Thank you very much. Um, now we're hopping over across the globe, and we're going to Buenos Aires in Argentina. Porsche is exhibiting at the Malba Museum, and uh, the famous museum of Latin American art. That's right. Porsche is displaying in this exhibition the brand's history and heritage and there are also classic cars on display and members of the Porsche Club of Argentina will also be taking part. So, let's cross the globe to South America. We're here in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, on a very special day. A special day not just for sports car fans, but also for an iconic brand such as Porsche. Porsche is turning 70 years old today on June 8, 2018. And there's no better place than to celebrate that than here right at the Malva, which you can see behind me. The Malva is the Museum of Latin American Art of Buenos Aires. And it's a very popular museum. They host temporary exhibits here all the time that bring people from not just around the country, but from all over the region. So there's no better place to celebrate than here tonight. Tonight, Porsche is taking over the museum for a very special exhibit. And I want you to come with me and see what I'm talking about so that you can walk around a few totems in there that will tell you all about the history, the legacy, and the heritage of Porsche. Come with me. Now, as you can see, this is a very popular place. This is the entrance hall of the Malva. This is where people are going to be spending some time learning about the Porsche brand. And if you come with me, you are going to learn something too. Now right here, these are the totems that have been specially set up by Porsche at the Malva. And they include some of the milestones of this brand. This, from 1950, tells us how much people would have to pay for the first sports cars produced by Porsche in Stuttgart, Zuffenhausen. Then if we move to the next one, this is from 1954, and this talks about the iconic logo that you see on every car. We move on to 1968, the Porsche 911, one of the most iconic cars produced by Porsche. And finally, 1998, 
where we can see Professor Barry Porsche, who died at 88. We have the first person of the night that we're going to go interview. Gustavo Gioia, he's the uh, general manager of Porsche Argentina. Gustavo. Yes, welcome. Welcome to our... Please, thank you for hosting us. Yes. Are you having a good time? Yes, very, very, very good time. We are preparing this event during the last two months, no? It's an incredible it's party. A really old brand, no? All the, the preparations for this event, uh, we already began uh, two months ago, just inviting our customers, uh, trying to invite every member of our family, and now we're, we're going to visit an amazing collection of Porsche cars in Argentina. We are placing right below in a kind of secret place. We're going to shock our customers, a very colorful and uh, all the years and a, a complete exhibitions of our uh, Porsche family in Argentina. All right, now comes the most important part of the night. We are about to see the stars of tonight's event. Follow me. Look at this beauty. This iconic car is the 911 GT3 RS from 2017. This has been uh, designed as a race car, but you can actually drive it on the road. And RS means it's Rennsport, which means racehorse in German. This is the 911 Sports Classic from 2010. It's a limited series. Uh, only 250 cars were made in the world, and one of them is actually here in Argentina. This is another 911, one of the most iconic cars from Porsche. This is another 911 from 1997. This is one of the hottest events in Buenos Aires tonight. Everybody wants to be here, and you can see why. And now it's time for our main event tonight, the stars of the night. What everybody here tonight wants to see. I give you Porsche history. And we begin with the first Porsche Classic from 1956, the 356 Speedster. In 1948, Porsche created the first sports car, and it became such an iconic vehicle for this brand. Look at the 914 from 1970. This became a huge success. Back in 1970, over 13,000 units were sold. Follow me. You don't want to miss this. The 911 Targa from 1973. Look at its incredible design. Already cutting edge, already ahead of its time. Uh, the 911 Turbo from 1988. This was introduced to the public in 1998 at the Paris Automobile Salon. Okay, now this, this is the big star of the night. This is what all these people came all the way here to see. Obviously, they came here for the anniversary, but at the same time, they came to see the new Cayenne. The new Cayenne hits Argentina tomorrow, and everybody wants to experience it. Follow me. Let's take a look. Now this is what I call a state-of-the-art vehicle. Come closer. Take a look. Look at this dashboard. It doesn't get any better than this. This is what dreams are made of. This is probably the best SUV in the market right now. And it's hitting Argentina right now. You have media, phone, weather. It's completely tactile. Basically like having your own computer here. And last but not least, we have a very special wine here today. This bottle that I have in my hand, you see the label? It's been specially created for today's event. And this is from the Polenta Vineyard. The Polenta family has been around in Argentina for over 100 years. And the family remains committed to the kind of greatness that Porsche represents. And it's always right by the side of any new vehicle that Porsche introduces into the market all around the world.
All right, this is the end of our night from Buenos Aires, Argentina. But don't worry, the broadcast continues somewhere else around the world where we will all be celebrating the 70th anniversary of Porsche. In the meantime, I'm going to stay here and enjoy this delicious wine and look at these beautiful cars. So there's a wonderful event in Buenos Aires uh, with the Porsche club owners of Argentina. And he but obviously enjoys his wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Argentina has some very good wines. But um, actually, Phil, you don't really have to be a Porsche owner to be a Porsche fan. And this weekend in Montreal, with the Sports Car Together Day, people from all walks of life, and whether you're a Porsche owner or not, get the chance to experience Porsche firsthand and interact with the vehicles. And it's, it's a great way to, to get to know the brand. Yeah, and even in Montreal, in the French part of Canada, they're showcasing the 356 and, of course, models from all seven eras of the 911. And um, even, uh, and of Porsche, and even kids get involved because uh, they can do finger painting on a car that is uh, foil wrapped. I yeah. mean, uh, let's have a look at this. Hello, I'm Emily Duquette and welcome, or should I say bienvenue to Montreal, Quebec, Canada. We are in downtown Montreal and we salute Sports Car Together Day with an impressive collection for all of Montreal to see. This is Porsche on Peel. Buzz and the Porsche interactive display has been a hit for Porsche fans of all ages. The 19 Porsche centers across Canada have been busy with their local sports car together day festivities. Celebrate 70 fantastic years from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Happy sports car together. So this was a petrol pump in the old days, and this, of course, is a car that is still pretty cool and modern in now. Mint condition, I think. Because Porsche, uh, Porsche is more than the sum of its parts. That's very important. It's a car that you actually inherit. Yeah, and. Unlike other cars, I mean, you can't just inherit any car, but Porsche is built to last more than one lifetime. And here's a wonderfully emotional story from Thailand. Let's have a look. ประสบการณ์แรกก็ตั้งแต่สมัยเด็กๆคุณพ่อซื้อรถเด็กเล่นเป็นเครื่องยนต์สองจังหวะเป็นโมเดลเก้าสามศูนย์ก็คือรถบ
ก็ไม่เหมือนกับคือคือสิ่งที่ตกทอดมากับสิ่งที่เราไปซื้อเองมันไม่เหมือนกันอยู่แล้วตอนนี้ขับรถคันนี้ก็มันทําให้รู้สึกว่าเหมือนได้มีคุณพ่อนั่งอยู่ข้างๆไปไหนก็เหมือนมีคุณพ่อไปด้วยได้ทุกที่A wonderful emotional story, and there is one more very emotional thing that Porsche basically invented. It's race on a Sunday, drive on a Monday, because the Porsche has this daily usability. Porsche has achieved something that uh, people in the 40s and 50s thought was unbelievable. Ferry Porsche. He invented a car that, for that time, was so lightweight and so not typical for the time that it was really something special, and people couldn't believe it, especially in the U.S. Yeah, and and Porsche has been breaking the mold and disrupting ever since. So now we're going to show you the documentary "Decades of Disruption." A disruptor throws everything off balance. Changes history and forces everyone to play catch up. A disruptor is a car that that comes in and sets a trend, but it's not just literally setting a trend like saying it's a pretty shape. That's not disruptive, but coming in with something that is outrageous, really, and setting a standard that everybody else has to live up to. For nearly 70 years, Porsche has been disrupting the status quo with a history of groundbreaking innovations from the 356 in the 40s to the 911 in the 60s. In this decade's 918 Spider, Porsche's vehicle designs break the mold over and over again. These iconic cars became influencers for their generations and the generations that followed. Visions of beauty, science in the design, form, function intelligent performance and now another disruptor has joined the group Porsche is always blazing a trail and always looking to the future this is Porsche decades of disruption Going against the grain is one of the biggest things that I think Porsche especially has done for decades they've they've gone their own direction doesn't matter what the industry is doing, they have an idea, they chase it, they perfect it. In the 1940s, the car industry came to a crashing halt during the war. Afterwards, car makers hurried to stake their claim on the new and growing market. And one man changed the game by creating the car of his dreams. Ferry Porsche said I was looking for the sports car of my dreams and I couldn't find it, so I built one. So he created this car in his vision. And boy, did he do a good job. And they bring this bloody Porsche out. And it's, to it's totally off the wall because it's, you know, air-cooled. It's four cylinders. And it's sort of built very light and very nimble. You look at uh, American cars in particular, they're gigantic. You know, there's seven tons of metal wrapped around you. And they're as long as a city block. And then you look at the 356 and you go, what, what's this? <laughs> this is this beautiful little sports car that's peppy and fast, this wonderful sensation of speed without being terrifyingly fast, but that handles uh, far better than anything else that's being built around that time. The 356 was leading the way for Porsche. If you look at the design, you can see the whole Porsche design language, the engine, of course, in the back, the typical Porsche silhouette. We have lightweight building, we have all day usability. And the 356 is also a car which you can use on the racetrack, so you can win on Sunday and drive on Monday. And is reliable. That was the remarkable thing about it. People were used to cars breaking every time they drove up. I mean, you know, they used to talk about the British products as being, you know, operated by Lucas, the Knight of Darkness. There's a purity to the driving experience in this car. It's a very simple, easy, focused driving experience with nothing extra. No power brakes, no power steering, rarely a radio. You pull it, you want the top up, you pull it up. It had nothing it didn't need and everything it did. Just and, and it was geared towards, you know, the you know, the feeling of driving a car. Everything was around that. And nothing has changed. I mean Porsche to this day in the racing, the drivers are what it's about. Usually people see Porsche as a as a very male brand. But um, it's not true. The very first Porsche customer was a woman. 
when Ferry Porsche wants to start the production of the 356 in Austria and Gmünd, he had to create a budget and for that reason he had to sell the prototype. And this prototype was sold in 1948 to a woman in Zurich. It took until the year 1957 before the car came back to the company and today it's of course one of the most important exhibits in our museum. In the 1950s, car culture took over the planet, and the Paris debut of the 550 changed the world of auto racing. Its dominance of motorsport helped introduce Porsche to North American car lovers. The 550 specifically as a race car was minimalism at its finest. You think back to motorsport uh, in a time where it was all about horsepower, it was all about big tires and wheels, just add more, add more displacement, more tire size, more brakes and hope you get to the end. And here comes Porsche um, and, and the giant killer. Having less weight is like having more power, it's like having more grip, it's like having better efficiency. Less weight uh, acts on every single thing the car does. To me, when I first look at this car, I just think Porsche and racing, I mean that is it. And you look inside it and you go, look at it, it's so damn basic, you can't believe. But it's functional and that's what Porsches are about. It's like balsamic vinegar, you know what I mean? It's been processed and processed and really what's necessary and that's all that's there. Straight, uncut, sports car. The 550 Spider was uh, raced by many famous drivers in America. But uh, yeah, there were other celebrities and of course the most important one was James Dean and uh, yeah, maybe this is also part of the myth of the 550. That was a car you could drive to the racetrack. You're just like, here's my road car, beep, and you just drive up and you get your little bag out and your little leather helmet or whatever the hell they used back then and then you just go out there and whip everybody's ass and you just drive home, and, you know, have a beer or something. The 911 was Porsche. It didn't have to say Porsche. It was 911. End of story. The 60s saw disruption become the norm. But while many of the era's fads eventually faded away, one iconic disruptor became immortal. When you think of a sports car, you think of a Porsche 911. I don't know that there's any other car that's been that successful. 911 is that car that we've seen from 1965 through to today. And whatever you see it anywhere in the world, it's known by that shape. There's nothing else like it. Talk about an icon that's grown from a silhouette um, to present day. And when you line those cars up and you see where the evolution has come from, you see how much of the DNA and the roots are still vested inside of the car. And, and what works about that car and what works uh, from a driving experience, from a performance standpoint and from an aesthetics standpoint. It's an icon. It's, it's a car that sits separate of all of its competitors. When the Porsche 901 that's how it was called at the beginning, came out in 1963. People were not sure if it's still a Porsche. Some people just disliked it. But then, when the first uh, journalists drove the car and uh, yeah, presented their, their test reports, people started loving the car. I think what's so remarkable about this car is the fact that it did follow on from the rear engine cars that Porsche produced since day one. And of course, you do have the engine and the transmission behind the center line of the rear wheels. Very quickly, the 911 became an icon of the Porsche brand. In the meantime, we have seven generations, and soon we will build the 1 millionth 911, more than 20,000 racing victories. But the most important thing is that uh, I think there's no other sports car which has won so many hearts. If you ask a little boy to draw a sports car, usually something like a 911 comes out. There are many, many different models of the 911, but uh, a very unique one is uh, here at the Porsche Museum. It's a 911 police car. I met one of these uh, police officers and he told me that one day they were following a car thief and at the end he just drove to the right side and stopped and said, I can't escape from you if you are driving a Porsche. In the 70s, Porsche updated its own classic, introducing the 911 Turbo. It may not have been the first turbo introduced in the US, but it was the most important. The Porsche 911 Turbo is really a moment where they're creating a supercar, where they're creating something that's fast and a little dangerous. And that 76 Turbo, again, it's a, it's a nice, it's a little monster. It's a little monster that feels familiar, but you have to respect it. 
the turbochargers would punch or they would hit or whatever. There was a violence to it. It was really like a turning point for the brand that they showed that, that hey, this is what a race car really feels like. Now all of a sudden, they've stuck a turbo and a big wide flare and uh, wider wheels and really pushed the envelope. I was a kid and you know you have that 930 poster that uh, so many of us have had that was like brute over the top I mean that was a, a flash of some serious car senior prom I had just picked up my date I was getting on the 210 freeway going to someone else's house and I get on the freeway and on ramps in that car was so awesome and I came up and there's a CHP right in front of me I'm only getting on the freeway for like two miles I'm like oh and I just legged it I'm coming up on about 50 miles an hour faster behind him and right when he got past the off ramp and he couldn't turn I went Whoa! reverse lights at 60 miles an hour he threw it in reverse and he came, and I came out on the edge of the crest highway sideways with my teeth and got up the highway and around and pulled off and my heart was Whoa! it's not just a concept for me you know, that car was a game changer I have a 930 turbo myself and when you get that car uh, going on boost there's no time for texting there's no time for talking there's no time for music uh, that's driving that's spirited driving and uh, 930 turbo it's hard to argue about something being as engaging as that car the 80s were a turning point for Porsche the 911 was an icon and bestseller but the company was looking to move forward and push the limits of driving technology. People realized that Porsche was capable of changing everybody's perception. They were like the band that keeps making the hits, you know what I mean? Like you think, oh, there's no way they're going to make another hit and blow everybody away. And guess what? Here comes another one, the 959. When the 959 came in, it really was the game changer of that era. In fact, it was the fastest car in the world and probably the most stable and showed the world that we have to go all-wheel drive. The 959, I think, truly the first supercar. It, it was sort of a quantum leap, you know. Everyone's kind of saying, well, let's, let's make it a little more powerful, or we'll make it a little more of this, and that was just kind of like they said, let's just, what if we started with a clean sheet and just thought about, almost like the car version of going to the moon. Active ride, massive turbos, um, Everything that you, quote, couldn't do at that time, I think that that's really a period of the purest form of the word supercar. They went forward in time, and they, they built a car from 10 years in the future, or even further than that, really, and then they brought it to you in the 80s. It was just like head exploding. You'd read about it. It's like, how can this all be in one car? You know, no one makes it all-wheel drive with variable ride height and, and it, you can't do that. This car combined technology which is uh, available today already in the mid of the 80s. Performance of the car was outstanding and uh, it also had a, delivered a lot, of, a lot of luxury and so people got crazy. They made such a statement at such an important time in their life I think really. I mean they went out and did the Paris-Dakar with it and won it. I mean to go out there and take on the world's biggest off-road rally, the toughest event of the year anywhere and they go and win it, you know, with drivers that aren't really off-road rally drivers, they were racing drivers. You were never able to bring them into this country, so it really made everybody nuts. <laughs> and um, I remember reading about Bill Gates and how his was stuck at customs. Bill Gates and Jerry Seinfeld, who created show and display, which was a method of getting a car that wasn't really supposed to be in the country, but getting it here and through customs so that it could be shown and displayed. In, in other words, it's significant to car culture. And uh, man, if you drive it a little while, who's going to know, <laughs> right? Do we get to talk about the Career GT now? I love the Career GT. In the 2000s, Porsche set their sights on the supercar space and delivered a car that destroyed the competition. First disruption for me with the Carrera GT, V10, mid-engine, open top car, uh, large wheelbase, a lot of new space for, for Porsche to venture in. You know, I just drove one a few weeks ago. It's wonderfully analog, as opposed to the new 918 or anything new, which has got your paddle shifters and everything else. When you drive it, I think that's the one thing that really comes out. You're more part of the car when you're shifting gear manually with your hand, because you have to watch the revs and pull it through and clear the clutch. And you really are in the cockpit of a race car. The origin of this project was motorsports. In the late 90s, the Porsche engineers were working on a new racing car for Le Mans. 
but then there were some 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 rules changed and uh, Porsche decided not to participate in the year 2000 but the technology a carbon fiber chassis a V10 naturally aspirated engine all these uh, technologies were used for a new car and this became the Carrera GT I was able to buy one when I was way too young it made me a better pitcher it changed my life I was I had a 3.6 ERA before I got it and then the rest of the season I had like a 2.2 ERA because I was so happy first time I heard it rev up, it was the Monaco 2003 GP, and they rolled that car onto the front straightaway with Walter in it, and uh, I'll never forget the sound of that car. I mean, it just sounded like music and magic mixed together. I was sitting on this patio at a coffee shop in Malibu, and I heard this noise, and I'm like, what is that? And I heard it just zoom, 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 zoom. And I stood up, and I realized every guy in the place stood up, and we were like prairie dogs. It's an alien technology Swiss watch all put together. You know, it's got the craftsmanship that you expect from Porsche, but it's also got this art to it. And you can see like these kind of, these curves that look like a rocket booster you'd put on the back of a shark or something like that. But when you get in here and you look through these little laser cut holes and you see the carbon fiber oil tank in there and you see the pushrod suspension and how it all actuates with like really beautiful milled billet pieces of metal. All the other cars at the time were going automatic, making it easier to drive. This was making it more visceral, more real, more everything that a race car should be. But this is a road car. I can't believe that they actually managed to make this work, but it, it's one of the most beautiful cars of all time. It's interesting when you reflect on each generation, the 959, the Carrera GT, Every time a car comes out at that extent, you wonder, could they do any more? Could there be more of what we consider a hyper car? And each time, Porsche pushes the limit. You know, on paper, I think it was one of those things where everyone was like, whoa, four-wheel drive, hybrid, uh, you know? And then the Nordschleife lap record and all these things start to kind of like it line up and you see this kind of laser focus of Porsche is trying to build the absolute best car in the world. In the beginning, everybody smiled and said, are you going green now or is it for fuel consumption? And after a while, people figured out, oh wow, the performance of the car is completely different and the fuel consumption is extremely good. So that just showed the potential and it's the fastest car ever. It's the best sports car ever. It laps the Nürburgring the fastest than ever before. My first drive in the 918 was using the different modes and I turned it from racing, very loud, to all electric and my friend was able to talk on his phone. This ability of this car to run on the highway, the car that looks like that, in full electric mode, and then to turn into a race car just like that, instantly, a little turn of that little circling switch, you have this race car that can charge its battery by racing it. <laughs> and then you can run it in traffic without polluting. For Porsche, hybrid cars are kind of revisiting history. In 1900, Ferdinand Porsche started his career by developing electric cars and hybrid cars. Indeed, in 1900, he built the Semper Vivus, and this was the first functional hybrid car in the world. It's surreal the first time you get in, um, just getting your head around how much power uh, you have underneath you. When you go to a hybrid and the alternative, uh, just that such a direct amount of acceleration from the electricity, that was the biggest game changer for me. There still is a part of technology and user experience, and sometimes those two don't always get along, but with the 918, it's raw. Um, there's a huge amount of uh, R&D that goes into producing some of the numbers and some of the experience that it has, but in the end, you still feel that race-inspired engineering uh, behind it, and, and that's the part that's fun. It's the first of the future cars on a performance basis from the hybrid has really shown everybody that that is the way forward. The 918 is a shot across the bow of the whole car industry. The 911 with the little back jump seats, it's good for my, my boys because they're six and eight, but you know, you want to share that experience with people. Um, and, and you know, maybe your, your, your wife and another couple. The Panamera comes along and now here you go.
the Panamera is showing that you can take a four-door car that's really underneath the skin, a sports car, and, and you're able to kind of mush the, the attributes together so that you're not compromising. It w was true to Porsche, which is we want a car that is a true driver's car. I just happen to have a second row of seats. And you know, when you're in the cockpit of the Panamera, you forget there's, there's, there's seats behind you. You jump inside, you quickly respond and connect with driving position, with ergo, um, everything before you even turn the key and start it up. It's um, a car that sort of everything you throw out it, it's ready to deliver and then again you sort of snap out of it and realize uh, you're driving a, a, a luxury car. I had a whole day at the Nürburgring with Hans Stuck. I was in a turbo, uh, the 911, he was in the Panamera and we swapped over. That was an amazing comparison between the two. I mean that Panamera could stay with the turbo. That one out there now, I think, will be a little bit quicker than a turbo. I think race car drivers are always good judges for, for modern technology and, and, uh, and for high-performance cars. And with C.J. Wilson and Patrick Long, I think we have two really good types of these drivers. One more from the amateur side, one of the high-end professionals, one of the definitely best sports car race drivers in the U.S., and I think we can trust their judgment. This is the kind of cool experience that we're having right now. We're, uh, we're driving someone else's cars on a, tr on a track. Yeah, it's kind of hard to complain when you tell people you have to get up early on Monday morning and come out and drive some beautiful new cars around a private facility. We don't have to pay for tires, right? It has a sports car silhouette. As the cars evolve now, I mean, I'm looking at it and it's taken on its own identity. Like now the Panamera is identifiable as a Panamera. Not only do you have the, the wing, but you have the, the, the rear lights and everything, the kind of cluster that looks very, very advanced. I just, I just like looking at it, man. It's like watching you go through these corners and stuff like that, seeing as much yaw as you're able to create, um, but also looking at like right over the hip and seeing that, that supercar hip that you have right over the fuel door. Yeah, it's fun that there's still so much design aspect to these cars. I mean, you see the silhouette of the 911, but you also see, like you said, so much evolution in the hips and sort of that bulk masculinity through the back that still says sports car. I love that you can hustle a four-door car this hard, sub four seconds, zero to 60, but one of the most proud attributes of these cars for me is that you can hustle the car all day long. It's not like you put down the numbers for the magazine test and uh, then you gotta go cool it off for a couple laps. I mean, this car can be punished, whether it's launch control or just hammering some laps as we're doing here. This thing hauls ass. We're here selfishly just ripping these cars around the track. We got four seats, man. Let's go pick up some buddies. Yeah, we need to share this experience. I said, uh, 8,000 bucks. Hey, guys. We got extra seats if you guys want to hop in. Is this, uh, Uber Pool? You should be on it harder than that. But... <laughs> oh, you're kidding me. How is it back there, Mr. Bell? Are you comfortable? I, I, I never thought I'd sit in the back of Panamera, actually. I'm following the other car just now and looking out. It's a very elegant shape to it, it really now. It's much more, it, yeah. uh, you know, elegance and, and sort of got class. Yeah, there's few cars out there where you don't feel bad when you give uh, another couple the back seats to go to dinner. We're a couple now. We are there's no chance there, boy. Eh? CJ, no lie, I gotta take a break. Uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I got I gotta subtract a passenger. He's tapping out. Tapping out. Now, Liz, what do you like in a car? What are the things that you look for? Obviously, you, you like performance. You're, you know, you, you've got the bug. You don't like to sneak in quietly in the no, back. No, 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 no. I'm Brazilian, you know, and I like to make noise. you got to stand out a little bit, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in the back now. I was driving earlier. I can actually change the stereo from the back. So you can be, you can be a backseat DJ along with being a back, backseat passenger. Well, that's good, because I don't think you're getting the steering wheel back anytime soon from... <laughs> Well, what I can tell, so at least you have something to, to occupy you, 
and uh, at least give you some semblance that you're in control. I've got a chilled water, and I'm just watching my wife go to work right here. It's pretty interesting. Mr. Bell, Mr. Kendall, Mr. Long, and Mrs. Wilson, I've, I've had a great time, but uh, let's see if spikes uh, turn back to normal colors. <laughs> Porsche just unveiled another brand new version of the 2017 Panamera. This is an exclusive look at the world's newest disruptor, coming straight from Vesak, Germany. The question is, oh, what comes after 918, and, and what will be the next car from Porsche that is mind-blowing and, and really disruptive? And in this case now, it's, it's the Panamera Turbo S e-hybrid. Many of the guys that did the 918 switched over in the Panamera project and they brought all their ideas they had in mind in the car. In the, in the second generation of the first Panamera had a hybrid. That was more about efficiency and we learned from the, from the 918 Spider that a hybrid is also a, a key issue in terms of performance. And so this, this hybrid is really a, a performer and it's a fuel saver also. The number one in priority was this feeling and, and the driving modes and the behavior of the car, that it should be in the Panamera the same like the 918, with the drive mode, with the map switch and the steering wheel and, and all these things. And for sure, the assembly with the engine, the electric drivetrain or the electric motor, and then uh, a PDK, a, a double clutch gearbox, because nobody else uses a hybrid in combination with a double clutch, and all the software behind that how to shift and, and how to integrate the electric motor in this complex drivetrain. That went all over. The figures are quite impressive. The result of combining the combustion engine with the electric hybrid system is a total power of 680 horsepower and 627 pound-feet of torque. The acceleration will be below 3.3 seconds uh, from 0 to 60 miles per hour. It will be the, the fastest luxury car in the world, and it's a hybrid. Porsche's design team is constantly on the path to drive automotive disruption, and their most important vision is still in the works, the Mission E. Decade after decade, these iconic Porsche vehicles change the world. And Porsche has no plans to stop. What is that feeling that makes you feel like a kid again? What is that captivative energy that just makes you want to drive? Porsche came in to sort of disrupt, if you like, and to say, hey, we're here. We're going to make a real mark in the future. And of course, that was how it all began. It's a consistency that they are able to bring to the table with all these different either lightweight cars, race cars for the road, or taking a technology that used to only live in aerospace, and now it's a road car technology. It's, they just, they keep at it. Porsche is the ultimate disruptor. What an incredible history of disruption. I mean, there were so many little episodes in there, Tanya. Uh, did you know that the first customer was actually a woman? Do you know? I, I didn't know that, but it's, uh, it's a great story. And also that that particular model is so special to Porsche because they um, reclaimed it, they bought it back, and they have it on at the, at the Porsche Museum. Yes. So you can see that first model bought by a woman. Um, at the Porsche Museum. And also that they, that they got this rebel image after James Dean bought one of the 550 Spiders. I mean, it's such a great, it's such a great, um, like this, this image that was created through one, just only one actor from Hollywood. Huh? It's amazing. Yeah, and, and just all these wonderful stories of, of disruption, all the things that Porsche managed to do that everyone said is impossible, but then, you know, they're seven, 10 years ahead and they, and they managed to, 
to make it happen. Especially That's in the forties and fifties to to create cars that were not like these heavy cars with lots of metal around them, but to have a sleek um, a 356. So uh, Ferry Porsche really was disruptive from the start, and it, they are still disruptive today. And but now, now <laughs> we're going to Mexico. Exactly, to it's the, the big finale. <laughs> to the Formula One Grand Prix racetrack called Hermanos Rodriguez. Those were two famous Mexican race drivers. Yeah, and um, tomorrow uh, we can already tell you that we have lots of program for you starting at 11.15 in the morning. We're going to show you all the highlights from the US, from the Netherlands, from Australia and, and, and from all the continent. And of course, we're going to be in Stuttgart, Stuttgart, right? Stuttgart, the home of Porsche. And there we're going to have interviews with Magnus Walker, the urban outlaw and the, one of the brand ambassadors for Porsche and of course Patrick Dempsey will yeah, you, be You are be looking there. forward to Patrick Dempsey, <laughs> right? <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't get to be there live, but we can share it with you. We'll watch it here and um, I hope to see you there tomorrow, 11.15. And of course, share the hashtag SportsCarTogether. Sports <laughs> see you tomorrow. I'm hiding this from all the people upstairs and I'm showing to all the whole world. I mean, that's, that's something weird. You know, that's something weird. That's Mao, our camera guy, our photographer. He's doing an amazing job. Super. Pablo, do you think this is going to do for not the 900 people that are up there? I think not. But you know, we'll have another one. It's another surprise. But also, do you know, who will do for the 1,000 people that we have up there? Jekko. This is the DJ that's going to play for us in a couple of minutes. So come with us. It's really good. I leave you. Bye. Thank you so much, boss. So, so we have here Jekko. Hello, Jekko. How are you? Hello. Fine, and you? Fine. Thank you. So we just wanted to take a moment to interview a little bit Jekko because... I used to tell him DJ Jacko, but then they told me that that was completely wrong, right? So, uh, <laughs> what? So I'm sorry, he's French, so we're going to have to do this uh, translation right now. Geoffrey, my name is Geoffrey. But my artist name is Jacko. Great, so uh, how did you start playing? How did you start playing? Parce qu'en fait, j'aimais beaucoup euh, la fête et euh, mettre la musique avec mes copains. Et j'ai eu la curiosité de commencer à développer un peu ben, le DJ set et euh, ça marchait quoi. Le goût à la musique, je pense que. Ok, so what what he said that he started uh, because he liked the music and uh, he started with his friends uh, playing music uh, since he was young and then uh, that's basically that's how he started actually in Mexico basically. Uh, have you been like to a celebration this big before? Dans une dans un événement de de cette taille. Quelques années, mais pas avec autant de voitures pour de ma vie. Je n'ai jamais vu autant de ma vie de voitures. Incroyable. Okay, so uh, he started basically uh, eight years ago already. Oh, okay. So, and how old are you? Can I ask that? I, uh, He's 31. Oh, okay. For me then. I'm old. Yeah, he's very old. <laughs> okay, and, uh, well, are you liking uh, the event? Have you uh, been track? Uh, maybe we can let Stefan try you around or... Yes, I saw the car, uh, it's a big event, I like this event, good music, 
I played good music, I think. And uh, yeah, good people, and uh, it's very, very crazy. It's, it's uh, awesome. Never I saw so many boats, so many people to drive. It's, it's, wow, very good. So you can follow Jacko in, on Instagram at, at Jacko. Uh, so please follow him and please stay tuned with Porsche Mexico with Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Remember Mexico, thank you so much. Um, stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. No.